Thank you, guys. You can be seated. I'm going to ask them to put up the picture of our family real quick. Thank you so much for all those lovely, kind words, Pastor Georgie. We're so thrilled and honored to be here. Okay, over there, there's a picture um, of our family, but it's missing the two little, we've got two new grandbaby girls that came this last summer. They're not in that. We need a new picture. But um, last night, I was, that's our newest, that's little Dakota, and um, then baby Rose. Yeah, those are the two names. So now we have seven. Now we, it went from the Fab Five to the Super Seven. So we're so blessed. And like Pastor Georgie said, we've been married like 40 years. Pastor B.J. Putnam, he's been here with Melody at your church. That's our son-in-law, and that's our daughter, Melody. And so this morning she said, I know Pastor Shane. I hung out with him. He's so great. He's so nice. So I just want to encourage you today. I wanted to read a scripture from Psalm 31, 19. It says, Lord, how wonderful you are. You have stored up so many good things for us, like a treasure chest heaped up and spilling over with blessings. And at home, what we like to do is I have a treasure chest at home and when the grandkids come over, when they leave, they get to pick a prize out of the treasure box every time they come. And I want to encourage you, if, maybe if you don't get it like a personal prophecy today, you can grab that word. You can grab that blessing. You can grab that gift out of the treasure box and say, that's mine. Because God's no respecter of persons, and he wants every single person to get blessed today and have a gift from him because he's such a good God. But uh, this is my... I love my husband. We've been married over 40 years. He's so awesome. And um, I know he's going to do great today. I think he does better when I'm with him because I pray for him the whole time. So thank you for allowing me to be here with him. But I love you guys. Thank you so much for everything. Thank you, fun girl. It is really an honor to be with you and enjoy church. And we had a wonderful dinner last night with Pastor Shane and Georgie, would you just tell, Pastor Shane is not here, he's at the other campus, but uh, would you just tell uh, the Baxter family that, that you love and appreciate the, the quality of leaders God sent here to build this church? Come on, everybody give it up for Pastor Georgie, Pastor Shane, world-class leaders, wonderful, come on. We honor, we appreciate, we love what God has done here in this family. People ask, you know, um, what? Things that are meaningful to pastors are, number one is that we covet your prayers. Just always pray for your pastors. And you'll find um, often when we pray for people, God leads us to actions, you know, benevolent and kind actions toward, it doesn't matter who it is. And I tell people, God will fill you with love for the people you pray for. And uh, just as pastors, just pray for your pastors and appreciate them and don't take for granted what God has done here at Enjoy Church is not normal. So this is an, an extraordinary church, and we want to be appreciative of being in a move of God. You're in a genuine move of God, and so we want to honor that and be appreciative of just, I mean, come on, the worship was awesome today. Worship team, you guys rock. It was wonderful. That, that new song was wonderful. So you've got a bunch of really cool things happening. And, uh, yeah, so we're, we're excited. Tonight's service, we're going to have less time constraints, and I'm going to be able to have more personal prophetic ministry. I'll have a, a short word in ministry time. And if you can make it back, I, 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 I know it's going to be a fun time. But it's an honor to be with you guys today. I'm going to share a couple of things. My title is Shave It Off. Shave It Off. So it's perfect that there's a man with a beard sitting right in front of me. It's like a prophetic moment. Sir, I'm going to be looking at you this whole sermon. And don't take it personal. But shave it off. No, it is. So shave it off. Our text will be Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. And uh, as we open God's word, let me share something uh, humorous with you. As you find that scripture, there was a family that had identical twin sons and they were physically so exact it was hard to tell them apart but their personalities was were opposite one was a optimist and one was a pessimist and when they turned 10 years old they their father did, did, tried an experiment he went out and bought every imaginable toy a 10 year old boy would want and he put it into the pessimist twin son's room and then he went out and got a truck full of horse manure and put it into the optimist son's room 
Later on that day, he was in the hallway, and he heard someone crying, and he turned in, and there was the pessimist twin boy sitting in the midst of all these open toys, these open presents. He was bitterly crying, and the father said, son, why are you crying? And the boy said, daddy, someday these toys are all going to break, and now all my friends will be jealous of me. Look at all the batteries I have to buy. And he went back to crying. And then he went down the hallway, and he turned into the optimist twin son's room and saw him jumping up and down for joy in the middle of the horse manure. And he said, son, why are you so happy? He said, daddy, there's got to be a pony in here someplace. <laughs> and I just want to encourage you, if you're in a horse manure season, there's got to be a pony in here someplace. Or... As the Bible says, all things work together for good. We, 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 we know it. We know that. In fact, Romans 8, 28 says we know. We know with confidence. We know with, the, with eternal uh, you know, faith and security and because of the nature of God that all things work together. They synergize. They, they cooperate. God makes even bad things become good. If it's not good yet, it just means God's not done yet. And we don't want to give up before he's turned it for good. In Genesis chapter 41, this is the release moment of the great uh, leader, Joseph, from a uh, uh, 13-year journey from his family's house to the house of Pharaoh. And in, in those 13 years, God was honing his heart. God was carving out greatness and character and godliness and maturity and wisdom and, and all the things and patience and all the things that would, that would be necessary for his eventual ascension into leadership. And so, you know, the Lord never wastes a season. No matter what you're going through, there's value in this season. There's a purpose and a reason for every season in God. And, and it's amazing what God can do even in difficult moments. But this verse reads, Genesis 41, 14, And Pharaoh was sent and called for Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And Joseph shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Let me read it again. Pharaoh was sent and called Joseph, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon. And he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this amazing church. What an honor it is to stand in Pastor Shane and Georgie's pulpit. I pray, God, today you would not your servant, your word, and your people. Have your way today. Do miracles in this room. Thank you for the testimony of what Enjoy Church is. And thank you for the honor of being here. In Jesus' name, amen. I absolutely love this verse, and I love this story. It shows the faithfulness of God, and, and it shows what God can do if, if we don't quit. See, the, the enemy can't win unless you quit. And in, in the process of God, when God gives you a promise, it begins a process. That, promise, that process guarantees an outcome that pleases God and satisfies your heart's desire if you don't give up on the process. And, and that process involves often unusual things, but God never changes his mind about what he wants something to be. His purpose for for us is eternal. His purpose for the church is eternal. His purpose for Melbourne is eternal. What we find and tap into and allow God to manifest his purpose, man, God gets the glory. Anything that fulfills its purpose brings God the greatest glory. And the church, our lives, our cities, our our country, every every part of it. It's, It's cool that your our president or prime minister was in America with our president um, yesterday or today. And uh, so I've come here as a cheap uh, imitation of your prime minister. No. <laughs> In exchange, uh, somehow you didn't get the, bit, the better end of it. In this story, there's three quick points. When Joseph had been waiting for 13 years for a breakthrough, and they came, the, 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 the palace guards would be this ornament, they would be the the strongest, biggest, most military successful, but also they would have palace uh, ornament uh, uniform on. And so standing at his prison cell came these guards and say, today's your release day. Today's your day to move into your destiny. And, and then they said, we can't walk there. We're going to run there. And, and quickly just means in the Hebrew running. They brought him running. He ran from prison to the palace. And it's a portrait that when God moves... He can move so quickly, so suddenly, that there is in the heart of God the capacity to accelerate your breakthrough 
if you just don't give up before it comes. And so he waited 13 years, and in 13 minutes, his breakthrough came. So it's amazing what God can do in one week, which you've waited a decade for him to do. God can, God can turn back time. Joel 2.25 says, God said in the first voice, I, I will restore the years to you, the years the locust has devoured. God can do so much. I was praying for a couple on Wednesday, I believe, or Tuesday this week in our church, and they have a, a large business in Phoenix, but they had um, some, some, they'd done work and not been paid for it for several months, like six, eight months, and so that was creating kind of a calamity and uh, forcing all kinds of pressure on their business because they're owed hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars, whatever it was, and they couldn't pay salary, and, and so they came in for this emergency meeting, and I said, well, let's, let's stop, and it, we, I, I just said, in Jesus' name, I command those funds to be released, and so while I prayed for them, they got the text, funds are being released. Before, before the amen of that prayer, they've been waiting eight months, whatever it was, funds are being released right now, and it's amazing how fast God can move. Amos 9, verse 13 says this in the message translation. Things are going to happen so fast your head will swim one thing fast on the heels of the, uh, of the other. Everything will be happening at once. Everywhere you look, blessings, blessings like wine pouring off the mountains. Everything will be happening at once. Things are going to happen so fast. So get your tennis shoes on because this is going to be a running season. I feel it because whenever we travel, um, we pray that God only sends us to places that we're supposed to be at. So we feel very confident that we're supposed to be with you guys this weekend. And we feel like that there's a breakthrough moment that's about to happen. And we're supposed to confirm that and, and declare that to you. So I declare over your church, enjoy church, and over your life, acceleration in Christ's name, that God's speeding up things and moving powerfully and gloriously. And he's going to do everything he's promised to do in your life, in the church's life, and in the the kingdom of God in this region, God has awesome things in store. Amen? Amen. The second thing was, while they're running, they're, they're, they're sprinting toward the palace, and they hand Joseph a, a, a razor blade, some sharp knife, and they said to him, shave off your beard. So everybody at the prison had a prison beard because they weren't entrusted. That was the kind of uniform look because prisoners weren't entrusted with sharp <laughs> weapons. So every man that could, and that would be most of them, had beards. And so they said to him, you got to shave this off. And so he had to make the choice to shave off his beard. Now, here's an important point. You can't look like your history when you enter your destiny. And so God, God gives us the tools in his kingdom, in his word, by his spirit to shave off things that would try to defile the next season of our life. And so when we go through things, Isaiah says, when you walk through the flame, you won't even smell like fire. There will be no, it won't affect you. You'll be able to emerge from difficult things with a sovereign grace from God that really equips you to um, have a... a have a freshness of spirit. So part of the, 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 the continual promise of us as believers is God makes things new. I make all things new. We have new life. Amen. We, all of us had new birth. He gives us, his mercies are new. Lamentation says every morning they're new. The newness of God allows us to have a freshness that carries us into uh, unusual capacities and strength. Uh, I want to talk about this for a minute because this is an important thing. This, to me, when they handed him a, a razor and said, shave off your beard, it represented a metaphor of his whole story. Because Joseph had been vitally betrayed by his own family. His, the, the, the greatest hurt in our life comes from the people that are closest to us. And so he's betrayed by his older brothers, his hero figures, by Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, these great patriarchs of history. Yet they betrayed him, sold him as a slave to the Israelites, told his father that he had died. And so the men that, that should have protected him betrayed him. The people that should have created a safe environment for him sold him into the vulnerability, 13 years of really a hellish journey. And so... Joseph's going through all that. So, but the very people that hurt him were the people he was called to lead. See, see, the devil will try to fill you with offense against the very people you're called to make a difference in. 
And, and so one of the things that we have to get really good at in order to fulfill destiny is we have to be really good forgivers. People, Mary and I have been sharing about marriage in uh, the last few weeks at our church. And, and so, oh, Pat, what's the key to a, a, a great marriage? Well, I tell people, you got, if the, the first key is marrying an angel. So I found an angel. And, uh, but the second key is we're really good about forgiving each other. Now, she got the bad end of that deal because I have to forgive her of a couple things a year, but my list is kind of longer. But we're good forgivers. We don't go to bed mad at each other. I tell, I tell young couples, never go to bed mad at each other. Mary and I never go to bed mad at each other. Of course, that's why I look so tired all the time, but we never go to bed mad at each, at each other. And, but we learn to forgive. So Joseph had to make the choice, and so... I just want to insert you just here for a couple of minutes our story. Mary and I have been married 40 years. I've been in the ministry 41 years. We have four beautiful kids, seven grandkids, and, and uh, I'm the son of a pastor. We started our first church after being a youth pastor, after being a worship pastor and associate pastor. I started my first church at 27 in my hometown of Scottsdale, Arizona. The Lord blessed it. My worship leader was a person named Israel Houghton. If you know worship music, that's a pretty a well-known name. Our youth pastor was Ricardo Sanchez, one of our uh, um, uh, children in our youth and children's ministry was Katie Perry. I don't take all, yeah, that's, I don't know if I should even tell people that. <laughs> but uh, she's going to fulfill her kingdom destiny in Jesus' name. I'll just watch what happens next. So God, that church blew up and it was um, four or 5,000, or 5,000 people on the weekends. And we were building a building in 1995, after 10 years, that would seat 4,800 people. So the building was about halfway on. The, st the steel structure went up seven stories. And our church treasurer, who ran our businesses and had a, a savings and loan, kind of a financial institution in town, embezzled from us $20 million. So he took all of our church accounts, he took all of our personal accounts, and about 2,000 people lost money with him also. So we had a public scandal. The worst thing that can happen in a church is that kind of thing. So we had this massive public scandal. Uh, I, you know, we were in the front page of the paper 10 times, headlines 10 times. And, uh, you know, the, I can say a lot about that. It wasn't hardly ever all true stuff, but it was just massacred there. We had six lawsuits, two class action lawsuits. I had 15 concurrent attorneys at the same time representing kind of a whirlwind of activity. Um, our church grew from 5,000 to about 150 people. So on, on church growth charts, that's the wrong way. <laughs> Do you have your chart upside down? No, it's the way things are. We're, we're trending down. And uh, I became manically depressed for two and a half years. I knew I was, the, I, I was seriously depressed because I was just finishing my PhD in psychology. I laid on my own couch, my own couch and said, sir, you're very sick. I said, I know I'm sick. Back off, Jack. That kind of inner dynamic happened, and uh, my oldest son became a, addicted to drugs. He was a, um, a world-class athlete, and so everything, we became homeless. Everything that could go wrong went wrong, almost, um, and so into a couple of years into that, the Lord said to me this. He said, Michael, would you like the pain you feel to go away? And I said, yes, I would, Lord, Lord. In fact, to help you out, I've made a list of some names. If you simply would kill these people... I'm pretty sure I'll feel better about what I'm going through. Now, here's what he said to me, and, here, and here's really the crux of my whole message. He said, Michael, if you will forgive the people that have hurt you, I'll make you forget the pain they've caused you. If you will forgive the people that have hurt you, I'll make you forget the pain. Joseph has a son in the same chapter. His name is Manasseh, which means to forget. He says, God has made me forget all the pain of my family. Now, when the Lord said that to me, it sounded too good to be true. I, 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 I know that forgiveness is not an option. You know, we have to forgive because we've been forgiven. In fact, Jesus said, if you don't forgive, forget about your prayers being answered. And just, you know, there's, forgiveness is the cornerstone. We're forgiven. We're commanded to forgive all the time. Everyone doesn't matter. But I said to the Lord, Lord, I'll do it, but I won't mean it. I'll say words of forgive, I forgive these people, but my heart won't be attached to my words. And the moment I said that, he gave me this mental vision. I saw this really long train, and on the engine was emblazoned the word faith. And down a hundred cars or more was the caboose. Finally, it came up, and it had the, 
the word feelings on it. And I know God was telling me this, that if I would set by faith my forgiveness in emotion, eventually my emotions would follow. You can't wait until you forgive, you feel like forgiving someone to forgive them. You forgive them and your feelings will follow. So sure enough, I started praying for people. And um, uh, I'm praying for people. I made a list. I was checking it twice. Everybody was naughty. Nobody was nice. And uh, about six weeks into it, because I prayed four times a day. I took this very serious. I'm praying for them. You know, Lord, I was quoting God's word over various people. And I, I was in my car, and all of heaven came into my car. And I began to uncontrollably weep. And I don't, I don't know how I got home without killing anybody. And, but I got home. I drove into my driveway, and I realized... A couple of things. Number one, I didn't hurt anymore. All the pain of betrayal, all the pain of being crucified in the public square, all, all the stuff that happened to us was unbelievable. But all the pain left. And not only did the pain left, God filled me with love for the people that had hurt me. And I, at this day, I pastored some of the people who put me in the front page of the paper. And I pastored them with a pure heart, with no animosity, no offense, because Jesus restores your innocence when you forgive. Forgiveness restores your innocence. Forgiveness heals you. See, see, unforgiveness is like drinking poison expecting the other person to die. Unforgiveness is a horrific thing damaging us in every aspect of our life, emotionally, physically, spiritually. But forgiveness heals us and helps us. And so Joseph shaved it off. And I just want to really encourage you that no matter what's happened in your store, you're with your family, with the betrayals of life, the heartaches of life, don't let someone's hurt stop you from your next season of breakthrough. Joseph couldn't have gotten to where he wanted to go unless he shaved off where he'd been. And when we forgive, forgiveness opens the prison door of pain and lets us enter a new season with God. And when we forgive people, man, nothing but good things happen. In the New Testament, the main word for forgiveness or forgive is the Greek word is aphemi, A-P-H-E-M-I, and aphemi means to let go. And it's a portrait of a, a archer shooting an arrow. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm a really engaged grandfather with my, my grandkids, and so the oldest five, I call them the Fab Five, uh, for, for many years before there was two more, there was just those. And so I, I take them on dates probably once a month, and we go to a movie, we go to the video arcade, which is a very expensive um, I had to save up for that. The last two times I had to call my wife and say, honey, I've gone over budget. These video games are expensive. We go out for dinner. It's the last seven or eight hours. And I'm disappointed my last two times because if, if we do the movie last, my, my last two times I, I go into the movie and I have this time, I'm not going to fall asleep. Five minutes into the movie, I'm sleeping, you know. They're taking pictures of me. They're doing funny poses around. Look at Poppy sleeping. They're making fun of me. And, uh, but I can't help it. It's, but, uh, so I, I, went, I, I think it was six or seven years ago when the movie Frozen came out. And so, my, so my, my, especially my granddaughters just loved that movie. So every time they come over and I'm watching them, Poppy, Poppy, we want to watch Frozen. I said, oh, good. This will only be the 787th time we've seen it. I can't wait to see it again with you. We watched Frozen, and there's a song in there called Let It Go. Let it go, let it go. And I saw the movie so many times. I said, God, please let this song go from my mind. It's, it, it's let it go, let it go. And, and, but forgiveness lets it go. Let's it go. Let's it go. I was called to testify against a man who stole our money in federal court, and he put me into a holding room in, uh, um, in the, big, the big, massive downtown Phoenix building, and I, I just assumed I'd be alone. I walked in there. It was a massive wooden table, and at the far end was a woman. The moment I walked in, she dropped her head and actually hit her head on the table and began to uncontrollably sob, and I thought she was having a medical emergency. I didn't know who she was. I started running toward her. It was a big table in a big room. And uh, because I was concerned for her. And when I got close to her, I realized she was saying a mantra. Can you ever forgive me? Can you ever forgive me? When she lifted up her head, she was the first person who brought an accusation against me in the press that was a complete lie. But the paper put it as the headline of the front page. Pastor Maiden said this or did this. It was a, the opposite thing was true. 
and she had lied. She had lost money, and she was hurt. She wanted to hurt me. And so here I am with the person who put me in that front page headlining of the newspaper with a lie. And so she's completely guilt. She feels so condemned by it. But I felt, I, I lifted her up and I said, please don't cry for me. I don't hurt because Jesus healed my heart. And I spent the next 15 minutes praying and ministering and counseling her because Jesus knows how to make your heart be pain-free. He specializes in that. Amen? So just a couple more things. I need, I need to go faster. So the last thing that happened was they handed jo Joseph shaved and they handed him a new robe, a palace robe. And he said, here's your new robe. And, and robes in the Bible speak of identity. Isaiah says it like this. God's robed us with the garments of salvation, the, the robes of righteousness. So in, in the New Testament, Paul said, put on the new man, which is renewed in righteousness. Was, so so in, 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 in the New Testament, we keep putting on our new identity. The Bible self-identifies itself as a mirror, and we're called to look into it and, and because that tells us who we are. Now, here's a couple of big important points because your identity is the key that unlocks your destiny. The revelation of your kingdom identity is the key that opens up doors of purpose and destiny and all the dreams of your life. And so when you don't know who you are, you don't know what you're called to do. So when you see yourself wrong, you see everything else wrong. It's impossible to see life right when you see yourself wrong. Come on, come on. So identity, so I tell in, in, in evangelical Christianity, the kind of Christianity that we belong to and Joy Church does and Church for the Nations the most important thing we have, the most important thing in life is what you believe about God. Because eternity hinges on who you say Jesus is. But I add this second little point. I believe the second most important thing in life is what you believe about yourself. What you believe about yourself. And so it was important that Joseph walked into the palace as a prince and not a prisoner. See, see, when you go through things, you can't let those things tell you who you are. You have to let God tell you who you are. And, and Joseph, when he, he, had to, he had to take off the uniform of the prison and put on the palace guard because that was his true destiny as a servant of God. And so Joseph made the, that beautiful transition. Joseph put on the way you see yourself determines the way you see everything else. We can't see life right when we see ourselves wrong. 1 Peter 2.9 says, You're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar, special, called out people that you might show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God wants you to know who you are. You become dangerous to hell and valuable to heaven when you know who you are as God's child. Amen? That's the way it works. I, just a couple of things in these closing moments. Jesus Christ healed me from depression. He healed me from the, the grip of manic suicidal thoughts 25 years ago. Um, well, it would be 22 years ago. And I have so much faith for God to heal people that are going through things. And if, you're, if you've been fighting discouragement, depression, anxiety, man, in Jesus' name, I declare there is hope for you that Jesus, in fact, that this church is anointed to heal people from mental disease. This church is anointed to be a cancer-free zone. But if you say, Pastor, I've been fighting some discouragement, I've been fighting, maybe you actually know it's depression or anxiety, would you just give me a chance to pray for you quickly? If that's you, if you say, would you hold up your hand and just let me pray for you this morning? You've been fighting discouragement, hopelessness, or anxiety. Don't, don't be afraid. Thank you for your honesty, beautiful people. And uh, just keep your hand raised. If, if someone has their, their hand raised around you, would you help me pray for them, church, and just stretch your hands toward them? Father, we pray for our brothers and sisters this morning. We pray your life in the name of Jesus. And, Lord, you raised me from the death that, that life had put me in. And I declare that a resurrection season comes upon these men and women, that you're with them to help them, that there's resurrection, hope, and grace, and strength because of Jesus in their story. We thank you for it. God, I thank you for a new, a new spirit, a new hope, a new faith. We take authority and we rebuke the assault of the enemy. We command every lying thought to leave and every lying voice to disappear. We loosen the kingdom of God in Christ's name. So I've got a, a, a word for this lovely couple. Are, are you guys together?
Yeah, so I got a great word for you. I saw like a bank account that was accruing all kinds of both deposits and interest. So in this season, like Cornelius, God's pouring out on earth a memorial you built in heaven. And in your family, there's two miracles going to happen. In fact, one of them, I believe, is happening today. God is reversing the direction of someone you love. God's breaking through a barrier. And this is a breakthrough moment. You know, sir, you have a great heart. You have a heart of gold. You are a valuable and uh, very uh, important person to God and to his kingdom. I don't know what you do here. I just know that God really likes you guys and thinks you're awesome. And I declare that your season has changed. Watch these next three months. So God, I bless this couple. Declare that you're for them, you're with them. And thank you. So in both things, so one of them came from the front, one of them came to the back. In both areas where bad news has come, I loosened two miracles into your story. One of them began two and a half years ago. One of them was six years ago. So things that have been uh, not quickly resolved. God, I think of a supernatural, accelerated resolution for, for breakthroughs, for testimonies for this couple. For what you're about to do in Christ's name, amen. Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Lord, I pray for anyone who has incurable, if you have a physical need today and uh, need a physical healing, would you just hold up your hand? I'm going to pray for you because Enjoy Church believes that by the stripes of Jesus we're healed, we, that we're a faith a believing church that we believe that Jesus Christ still heals the sick and helps people. So Lord, we pray for our friends. If someone has their hand raised around you, would you stretch your hands or touch them on the shoulder? Father, we declare life. I especially pray against blood disorders and cancer. I command them to lead this room and I loosen creative miracles right now in Christ's name to everyone that needs it. Thank you, God, for your healing grace upon these precious lives. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. We give you the glory. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, I, I, so I saw a couple of things. Number one, that this would be a place where people would come with all kinds of anxiety and all kinds of mental disturbances and be healed. Number two, that there's going to be notable miracles concerning cancer and incurable diseases. This is a, going to be a house of miracles. It already is, but it's going to be known around the world for that. <laughs> Lastly, I am now in the negative space, but you should bow your heads for just a moment as we close this service. We want to give every person here a chance to know Jesus. And the, the love of God, we sang a song this morning about how much God loves us and living and dwelling and experiencing that love. That's what God has for you. There's not one person in this room that God doesn't love, that Jesus didn't die for, that God doesn't care about, that grace is not available to. And we just invite you, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, or maybe you've just, just been away from God in your walk with God, we invite you today to come home. I'm just going to say a public prayer in 30 seconds. But if you say, Pastor, I'm ready to give my heart to Christ. The Bible says, whoever calls upon Jesus will be saved. God's ready to make, make your heart his home. And maybe you say, Pastor, I'm just, I, I need to come back to Christ. I need, I'm ready for a comeback. I, I forgot to announce I had a book called God of the Comeback back there in the lobby. Make, make this your comeback day. Make this your comeback day. But if you say, Pastor, that's me, would you just wave your hand at me? We're not going to call you forward. I'm just going to pray for you quickly. Then we're going to go on. Thank you, sir. Anyone else say, please pray for me. I'm ready to come to Christ or come back to Christ. Thank you. Anybody else? Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. So young people in this room, come to Jesus. That's wonderful. Anyone else say, please include me, Pastor, in that prayer? Anyone else? Okay. Would you all just say this prayer after me and and for the folks that raise your hands, just make this your prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, today I receive your Son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. Thank you for forgiving my sins. I turn from my past. I surrender my future. And from this day on, I will follow you. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Amen. Hey, thank you, church. It's been an honor to be with you this morning. God bless you.